This time our topic is academism. It's, a, it's an interesting topic and I feel that regarding academism there are many misconceptions floating in the minds of the people and I want to clear some. Uh, but let's see what happened before academism. Now, let's uh, state something clearly. Uh, the Western historians, and maybe not just them, they try to, they try to tell the people in many different ways that uh, the nomadic way of life is primitive, it's not advanced, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a bit animalistic because animals also live a nomadic life. Now, let's fix this. In the olden days, if you lived in the city or in a village or wherever you lived, but you didn't move around, how much knowledge uh, did you find available to you? Just only the amount that was available in the valley where you lived, right? And because of this, there were uh, this kind of isolated people, like the German tribes, like uh, you name them. They had no clothes. Not so long ago, they had no clothes, no uh, cooking skill at all. They used to roast animals. And then the only uh, cutlery they had was a knife and then their hand and they ate like that. And <coughs> they had uh, no tailoring or whatsoever, uh, many of them, uh, except for animal fur. Somehow they, they knew how to tailor that. But culture basically uh, entered the West from the East. The West did not civilize us like many people would believe and therefore knowledge was always transported to places by people who moved. And before trading the nomadic people were the, those that transported knowledge. And <clears throat> the nomadic way of life is in many ways superior and in my opinion the ideal way of life uh, for a civilization to progress. It is not good to stay at the, same, at the same spot all the time, eat the same food, talk to the same people, read the same books. It's not, it's not uh, wise. Life is long and you should accumulate more knowledge, more experience, see more things, change your diet from time to time to prevent that you develop diseases and learn how to live with different people and how to have even regards to all, or for all, all human beings. So, <clears throat> urbanization was a program figured out because urbanization is absolutely paramount for humanity to arrive at the present uh, uh, structure of a society. That means millions of bloody fools living in the cities, uh, running after something that doesn't exist uh, most of the time, and uh, living unhappy life, but they just not willing to change. Or they just don't know how to change. Now, <clears throat> this was very unlikely to happen, let's say, on the Central Asian uh, steps. And <clears throat> let's consider the, the, the education of a child in that era and in the city now, today. Now, obvious that now we have academics that kind of uh, came up uh, and replaced whatever was there before. But what was there before? Well, well, 
before, first of all, other than the nobility and, and the kings and the ruling elite, people didn't really need to study uh, to become a scholar. To, scholars were to develop things, mental uh, values, yeah? Uh, they, they were developed by the scholars, but ordinary people basically they needed skills. And poetry was a skill also, but they may not have written poetry, but they did sing poems, they did have songs, and they could learn that from their mothers, grandmothers, and, and people around. And let's consider one fact. When you're a nomadic, and you're in the middle of nowhere, you can only rely on yourself. That means whatever you don't know, it doesn't exist uh, for you. It's just not there for you. And the nomadic people, the Huns, in English you call them Huns, but they are not the Han Chinese, they are different race. But later in the, in the area of China they, they merged, they mixed. But they are not the same. They are the Huns, come from Hungaria. They are Hun, Hun race and the Chinese are the Huns. So these Huns, let's call them Huns, now that you understand what I mean. The Huns were the first people to organize uh, a country on the steppes, which was basically a nomadic uh, uh, empire. They had cities. They did have cities, very big ones, and they had the ruling elite who stayed in cities as well as uh, stayed on the uh, stayed in uh, in tents and uh, traveled from whenever they had to, on military campaigns, exercises, or whatnot. Yeah? And when you're on the steps outside, you look in all directions, you see nobody else but your own self and uh, your own tribe, then you have to solve all your problems. That means what? It means that a nomadic child was educated into at least 10 different professions uh, what we find in academics. That means he had to know which plants to eat, which one not to eat. So he was good at herbal medicine for sure and maybe treating uh, broken bones, injuries, what not. So that surely he had to know. Now, he had to know how to prepare food, how to cook, because wherever he went, uh, whatever was there, he had to use and make food. So maybe he had to top up uh, what, uh, what he carried with what he found. Yeah? So he probably was an agile cook as well. If, it, if not, then they had to carry all the food. And that is just outright stupid to suppose that they ate every day the same. Every day they, they slaughtered the cow or something and they only knew how to make two dishes out of the meat, right? That's outright stupid. The reason why it's outright stupid is because they have found, somewhere I heard this, uh, a 3,500 years old, something like that, a cooking book written in old Hungarian language and it contained recipes. So. It's very ridiculous to suppose that the Han people didn't know how to cook and they were just eating raw meat. And <laughs> okay, then, so probably they were good cooks, but many of us are still good cooks besides uh, being the victim of academism. Then they had to know plants, they had to know how to uh, medicate livestock. That means they had pretty good veterinarian uh, basics. A horse is a very sensitive animal, it's very sensitive. They had to know how to cure their horses because once their horse is gone then they have to walk on, <laughs> on the land themselves and pull their cargo and forget it. 
and cows and whatever they had, the livestock they had to medicate. They had to know how to build a house. Okay, they built, a, they built, a, built up tents, you would say. But these people later on, they settled. For example, in, in, uh, in the Carpathian Basin, villages were started by families because basically wherever you want to settle, there, if there is nobody in the early days, you could settle because you just drill wherever you want and you get water from the ground. So anywhere you could make a village. And so villages were made by families and then they grew as, as they started marrying between different villages, right? So not so long ago they knew how to build a house because they give up the tents. You see, once the, once the Magyars left Kiev, the, I think the, the Swedish, I think, they occupied that land, and then from the south, the Byzantine Empire kind of closed the, closed the way, the road, for these people to travel on the steppes. And that time, the, the Magyar people decided that they will stay in the Carpathian Basin and they, whatever they had, they conserved in the form of a seed that can bloom when the right time comes. So they had to give up the nomadic way of life and at that time you could just settle anywhere where there was empty land and then make your own houses of clay or stone or whatever they, they had, but they had to give up the tenth way of life. Then, of course, they had to know uh, about the stars, astronomy. Uh, when you travel on the plain of Central Asia every day, you recline by the fireplace. What do you see? You see the stars. Don't, don't you think that your elders will explain to you which star means what and you learn how to read the stars? Of course they did. So they knew the stars. They knew how to navigate uh, following the stars for sure. And they knew much more than that. Then they had to make their own clothes, so they knew how to tailor. Then they also had to uh, make their own uh, utensils, chinaware, uh, clays and all that, and so on and so on. Repair their carts or manufacture a new wheel if it was broken, whatever. Easily a boy was educated into 10 academic skills as he was growing up. Then, Many, time, uh, many years later came academics and the academics that uh, we follow is uh, fundamentally, uh, basically I, I heard is a German type of schooling system. And <clears throat> now when you have a well constituted uh, person who has at least 10 skills that he learned naturally as his upbringing and you want to introduce academics, how do you explain it to him? That you want to tell him, just learn one thing. Go to university, go through all the schools, and go to university. Because before that teaching, a child was done, uh, probably at home. But there were schools, but not for definitely not for the nomadics, right? So the education was passed on naturally. They grew up in it and the culture was... Uh, so uh, intense, in, it was an intensive education, culture itself, so there was no way to escape. And then, so you want to explain to a child why he should follow academics or a president or a king or whatever, you know. You have to come up with some pretty good result uh, uh, to prove that your academic is better. But, before it's implemented, there is no result. So how can you do it? Now you have to make it look good. That's the only way. So academism is something that makes education look good. But the reality of it is that it's a corrupt system. And I will try to shed some light on it. Why? Now, <clears throat> what does academism do? Academism divide the knowledge of a person and robs him of his knowledge except the one that he uh, the person chooses to specialize on but that 
he will have, and the academy, uh, academism has to make it very big. Because if not, if just is, if it's just a skill, then it's learned in a matter of two, three years, and, and then and academism flux. Just nobody will believe in it. So who will follow all the schools up to university? So definitely, if you want to specialize in something, they will teach you, let's say, one third of good things and then two-thirds or whatever is there just to dress that subject up or that skill or that field of expertise just to dress it up to be sellable and to be worthy uh, to be called academic academic field okay so <clears throat> as a result of that Let's turn back to language study, because language is a skill as well as academics. So in the field of language learning, uh, what is being taught under language education uh, is partially important. And when Language is taught as a skill uh, by the mathematical English system, then whatever is taught in the class is completely important. There is no superfluous things that you will not use. So why is this partially important? Because academics uh, has its own purpose and that purpose was somewhat political to rob people of their knowledge that they, in, that they uh, got from their ancestors and forefathers and <clears throat> so basically academism is, is a nice word for a pirate-like system and for this to be admired it has to contain something that an ordinary person cannot reach. That means whatever skill there is, they give you a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge related to it and completely unrelated to it. But at the end, you will get a certificate that you went through this. Now that qualification, that, uh, uh, that certificate or that diploma suggest a value which people don't see that they can uh, achieve on their own unless they go through the academic ladder and uh, graduate from universities. <coughs> but, seriously, you know why I didn't like to study in school? There were subjects I really liked, but there was there was always, in every subject, there was things that just didn't belong there, in my view. And when they were starting to teach that, then I gave up. I just didn't want to work very hard in school. I like physics, especially uh, learning about the lights. I don't like calculations, formulas, Newton and all that. And <coughs> I could have found a passion for this, but when we started uh, learning about other aspects of physics, I said, enough, enough, I don't want this. If that's the price, then I don't want. <coughs> so, an academic method teaches things that are partly important, partially important. And they will graduate you in this so you will end up having a qualification which is not a guarantee to your ability to do anything with that, uh, with that knowledge because you are uh, qualified by somebody who also just went through the academics and uh, not qualified by life, unless, uh, unlike when you, when you progress in a skill.
that you use every day. You have to succeed in it, otherwise it's useful, uh, useless to you, and and there is no uh, there is no one to tell you uh, that uh, you have to do it better because life is there slapping you in the face every time you fail in that skill until you get it right. So when English is taught as a skill, then its qualification is ability. It guarantees ability. Otherwise, uh, how, can, how can you be qualified? But in the academics, you can get your qualification and still not be so good at uh, what you are studying. Okay? So here, uh, academics, uh, academism misses the point. This is the point and they have no other way because it's a pirate type organization or concept. Okay, <clears throat> so if academism teaches partially important things, then what is the other thing for? Definitely it's not for wasting time, there has to be uh, another reason and that's the academic agenda. So what is the academic agenda? Basically to narrow it down is for people to go through, get their mind formed to fit in the society. And uh, the academic agenda does not uh, uh, want you to, uh, to be let's say freedom loving, let's say efficient, let's say rebellious, let's say whatever. All these good things are kind of no-no. Now, <coughs> the academic agenda in the language learning is basically, and here comes the, uh, when, you, when you learn English as a skill, then you don't face the academic agenda. The purpose of your course is imparting the CALS, the complete English linguistic system. And there is no other agenda behind. Now, of course, the institution that teaches you that has to be paid. And if any institution implements this, definitely it will make a, it will make a pretty penny and rule the English industry in the country where it operates because he will face no uh, worthy competition in, in, the, in, the, in the industry. So the academic agenda, because it's partially important to the student, it is safe to say that it's not about the student. So then it's about what? Well, it's about the seniors in it, the teachers, the professors, and whoever is before the student. It's their agenda. And uh, for example, when it comes to creating a, a curriculum, people who are serving the academic agenda, they will come up with a book, and uh, the book will focus on pronunciation, vocabulary, and then grammar and then blah 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 all the academic things to make the language look very difficult and very big and uh, make you understand that you have to spend a lot of time and uh, you have to pay uh, many years to the school to teach you this thing and <coughs> this academic agenda what it does to the students somehow although not directly, but somehow indirectly, promises the knowledge of English. It promises that oh, if you work this hard, you will know the language. But seriously, nobody knows the language in, in its entirety because it's, it's too big, right? So that promise is already false. It's already false and for it to uh, be able to deliver on this promise, uh, they have to 
they have to sell you the knowledge of English. But the knowledge only exist, exists in the teachers at that moment because you are still just studying it, it's not yours yet. Yeah? And get this one right. You can never get the knowledge of something from another person. He cannot give it to you. He can make you learn it, yeah? but I cannot uh, give you my knowledge. You have to understand it and know it for yourself. You cannot know what I know. You can only know what you know. And I have to communicate my knowledge to, uh, to you so that in the end you go through the process that results in knowing it. Yeah? So a language is very big. It's not easy to give the knowledge. And academics promise, academism promises this, but it can only fulfill this if you are good at uh, what you are studying, that means you are good at English, okay? So that the fulfillment of this promise uh, is not uh, uh, the success of academism, in my opinion, but uh, or it is partly the success of academism, but it's mainly the success of the student, students themselves who are good at uh, languages. On the other hand, the mass promises the essence of the knowledge of English. And this is important. This is important because the essence is possible to be understood and imparted in the student. And when you want the knowledge of English, you have to study the whole language, it's like the ocean. But when you just want to understand the essence of that ocean, it is enough to research a single drop from that ocean. Because a single drop of the ocean contains the essence of the ocean. Okay, so there you already save time, effort and therefore money when we reach here in, in our uh, thinking. So when the academism uh, tries to impart a knowledge of English in the student, uh, of course uh, it's impossible because it's impossible to grasp the whole English language. It's impossible to grasp any language in its entirety. But if you get the essence, you, you can use the language and that language will function for you. So when the essence of the knowledge is, uh, is not focused, instead the entirety the knowledge of the English is in focus and that's a futile effort, then of course that uh, academic methods have no other way but to teach partly useful practices. And on the other hand, if you learn your English as, uh, as a um, skill, then you are presented with completely useful practices in the class. That means if you're not there and you miss it, you won't know it, but you will need it definitely in that form somehow. But if you miss a class in traditional methods, or you miss a week or a month, you still can continue. And like, you will just you are able to graduate and, and progress in the language just as much as, as someone who attended that month in the school. Yeah? Because the usefulness of the practices uh, they do is also partial. Now what kind of practices they do? Here is one sentence uh, and this kind of exercise is frequently done and required uh, by the traditional methods. Here is a sentence. Mary bought dot 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 ice cream for each of them. 
And then the student has to choose something to fit in here. A uh, and some the. And then they discuss how many different things can they put they can put in. Okay? So this why is this partly useful practice? Because it's basically a stupid exercise. It's a stupid exercise. Why? You remember here, the academic is not about the student. So the purpose why the students come to class remains in the shadow. And the academic agenda comes forward as the sole purpose, and that is to make the student attend classes as long as possible and uh, guarantee some kind of steady progress. Otherwise, the student won't come next month, right? So, <clears throat> here, what is it the student's practicing? He's practicing uh, and some the. But the student is not in the class to learn that. The student is in the class to learn how to make his sentence. So in the mathematical English system, these lunatic exercises are never uh, used. Instead, the mass uh, knowledge is symbolized and that is why the essence of the knowledge of the English is possible uh, for the mass to impact uh, in, to the student. So, the student gets the formula of a sentence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, dot, and then the teacher will tell, make a sentence with a, m, some, or the. And instead of reading other people's sentences and then just using his mind to figure out one aspect of it and then succeed in this, the student actually have to construct the whole sentence around what is required. And this is uh, the main difference between partly useful practices and completely useful practices, that completely useful practices always produce language. And partly useful practices, they produce some language and then take you on the merry-go-round. Now, if this exercise is so ineffective, why do they do it? Because the person, an academic, who makes this curriculum has a different purpose for teaching this language from the purpose of the students because academic agenda is not about the student. So what is his purpose? Well, basically he has to sell what he produces. Therefore, he cannot make it simple. He cannot make it simple, he cannot make it poor, he cannot make it very different, he cannot make uh, anything that is good will not sell. So he needs to put in a lot of words, a lot of grammar, a lot of pictures, a lot of sentences, because if you just put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, who is going to buy it? Yeah? And so on and so on. So why he's making it uh, is not exactly the same reason why a student would take up English classes. And that is why pity the students they have to go on a merry-go-round and the smarter, not the smarter one, those who are good with languages somehow come out quite all right. But it's an individual effort to come out with the knowledge of the, or the understanding of what the English language is and the ability to use it. Yeah? And <clears throat> with the math, on the other hand, it's not an individual uh, achievement to achieve the, the use of English language on daily, in daily life. It's basically quite automatic because if you just practice what is required, you will have the knowledge of how to do it. That means the essence of the English language is the know-how. And uh, so <clears throat> when a pirate-like uh, establishment like uh, like academism who rob the people or early people of their knowledge and they and and it uh, 
specialize them in a, in a small narrow field and uh, raise the requirements so high that they had to really just focus on, on that skill. Uh, when this pirate type of, uh, of institution comes down to practical uh, application, then you get these kind of problems. Because whoever is creating this kind of thing carries on the mentality of academism, which is uh, not uh, focusing and not serving the purpose of the students, but instead uh, working for the academic agenda. And then, of course, it is of no surprise that uh, a radically different approach, such as the mess, had to come from someone who was not uh, trapped by the academism. Me. You see, <coughs> a professor has, professor of English has a past, has a reputation, um, has a status to live up to, and has his, his title, professor or doctor, he has to live up to these things. Cannot make something that simple, yeah? Because his mind doesn't go in that direction. So, <clears throat> for the language learning to be uh, advanced from this because, you see, there are so many methods. One is better than the other. But altogether the whole thing doesn't make that much sense. But methods have been improved. And the people in this, they're sincerely trying to do good work. They're improving this system, hoping that the result of it will also uh, be better. But they are blocked by the academism. They are blocked by what they are in. And... Uh, Therefore, uh, they cannot come up with uh, something such as a simple way of imparting the knowledge. Now, creating the mess, of course, had to be a breakaway from academism. And that is why you don't find professor or doctor in, in front of my name. I don't have either of these and I don't need any of this. But I know how languages are learned because I have learned five languages in my life and I studied three more that I didn't uh, learn up to the level where I could use it for conversations. And I knew, I, I learned five of them all different ways. So I kind of have the idea how a language is learned. Problem with the academics is that they may be good at English, they may be excellent at English, but that may be the only language they speak. So they've never been through, uh, consciously, the process of picking up a language, don't know what part of it should be exercised, what part automatically will stick to the students. And uh, don't know how to improve that process of learning. So, <clears throat> Making the mess could not have come from an academic and it's not a bad thing. Because of that it is reliable, because I don't have the academic agenda to serve and whatever I say about the mess and the method, the traditional method is all my knowledge that I have accumulated.